you are muted. You're muted. Oh, sorry. No, okay. All. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can go. Thanks for organizing and hosting this workshop, Ben. Well, it's a great pleasure. No, no, the, the, the pleasure is ours, really. So, welcome everyone um, for this one-hour panel. Um, I think the title is quite explicit. Uh, so, so in, in 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 a big event like this, which is about the uh, the future of central banking, it seems that it is all sorts of asks for central bankers to reduce inequality and um, of course, we had to reduce climate change, and, and, we, and we thought um, um, we, we, certainly the role of fiscal policy should be discussed. And, and as we know, when you go with all these demands to central bankers, uh, they would often say, well, some other stakeholders should also do their job, and, and there are limits to what we can do. Um, and indeed, I think, interestingly, within civil society or academia the past, uh, the past years, there's, there's been a very strong focus on what central banks can do. And for some strange reasons, or just because of the ideological context, uh, we haven't been asking governments to do much where maybe, as, as, as my, my panelists will discuss, uh, maybe they, they have a, an even more important role to play. And, and even if, if they take action, maybe then everyone else just follows, central bankers, but also financial markets, uh, if, if only they would. And, and by the way, both central, uh, financial markets actors uh, and central bankers are asking governments to give a direction to the economy, a stable direction, so that they have they have a certainty uh, to put a price on carbon, anything else, so that the, the signals are out there, and then they can just align their flows. Uh, so that's uh, more or less the introduction. I'm joined by uh, Francis Coppola, Philippa Ziegler-Glockner, sorry for the, the massacre, uh, and Josh Ryan Collins. Francis is a prominent uh, economics and financial writer. She also teaches music. Um, and you should follow her, uh, her popular Twitter account and also uh, her blog, uh, Coppola Comment. Uh, Filipa is the head of uh, Desernat Zukunft, which is uh, a nonpartisan think tank that aims to explain uh, and rethink monetary, financial, fiscal, uh, and economic policy. She also worked um, at the German Ministry of Finance recently. Um, so maybe, maybe she, she's, she's Part of the reason that the, the German finance ministry came out today, as you, you might have saw, uh, uh, saying uh, that austerity is a bad idea. So maybe, maybe we can discuss that in a second. And Josh is with the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at the University College of London. And for many years, he's been working on, on these issues of, of central banks, uh, fiscal policy, etc. So what I'd like is for this session to be as, as interactive as possible. Um, so we will go with your panelists now who will who, who talk for about uh, five, uh, five, seven minutes uh, to, to make their points and, and uh, put their, their passionate thinking forward. And then we'll, we'll open the floor for questions. And hopefully from there, we, we have an interactive discussion. You can raise your hands on the reactions button at the, the bottom of your screen. And the magic is that I will be able then to look at participants and you'll be in the right order. So I'll come to you. And when we get there, I'll ask you to, to have maybe a, a crisp question to the, to the, to the, uh, the panelists on what's been discussed or bringing an additional ID. Um, if that's not the case, we'll, I'll structure the rest of the discussion, but, but hopefully um, let, let's discuss all together. Don't be shy. Uh, I'm quite sure there's a lot of expertise in the audience. And without further ado, Francis, I'll pass uh, the floor to you. Hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and to speak to you all today. Um, and I hope some of what I'm going to say makes sense. Um, I think we've reached a little bit of a paradigm shift, which has been in a way triggered by the pandemic, but not really caused by it. So as we are today, we're finding that central banks are willy nilly backstopping their governments and sending a message to governments that they must do whatever it takes to pull us out of this pandemic um, and that they have the backs of their governments. That's essentially the message that's being sent to the markets. So we're hearing a, a certain amount of chatter in the markets about um, money printing and inflation, and all the rest of it, and central banks are going there, not on our watch. Um, as we come out of the pandemic, we might find that we need some stimulus. Um, central banks haven't got a lot of room for manoeuvre on that. So again, it's still largely fiscal authorities. And we may find ourselves having to do things like helicopter money. I'm agnostic about who does it, um, but somebody's going to do it because we need to get 
economies moving again. But the underlying trends that were there before the pandemic are still going to be there after it. So we're still going to have the challenge of climate change, and I know Josh is going to talk about that. We're still going to have um, automation, and indeed we're going to see more of that. We're already seeing further pressure in that direction caused by the pandemic and the changes in working practices that that's, that's forced upon us. And we're also going to see the pressures from an aging population, um, the demographic shift, um, and the historical anomaly known as retirement. So the fact that we have people living for longer, but not working for quite as much longer and spending more of their lives not working and living on fixed incomes, part of which are the returns from their capital set investments. And that brings me into another secular trend that I think has been there for the last 40 years, which has been that we've been gradually moving from a world in which capital is scarce and labor relatively abundant to a world in which capital is much more abundant and labor is relatively scarce. And that that has been causing the secular downwards pressure on interest rates that we've seen for the last 40 years. And I don't think that that is going to reverse as we come out of the pandemic. I know some people think it will, we'll have a burst of inflation, we'll be able to get interest rates off the floor. I think if that happens, it will be short lived and then the underlying pressures will come back to bite us and we will have to think seriously about what this world should look like in the future. So for me, we have to be thinking seriously about what we, how we deal with a world in which a lot of people are living on fixed incomes that they aren't earning, that they're simply expecting to be provided for them either from the returns on private capital or by governments or some combination of both. Um, and a world in which the um, working population um, is not growing at the same rate as the retired population. And therefore the burden of um, support, I don't want to use the term taxation because it's not about that. This is about the allocation of real resources between the working population and the retired population is shifting. We have to think therefore about things like the burden of taxation. Should it continue to fall, fall predominantly on labor and less on capital or should we be shifting it back the other way um, so that at least equalizing the tax treatment of capital and labor. Should we be reinstating the safety net that we've shredded over the last 30, 40 years and particularly in the last 10 years that's essentially said that people are responsible for ensuring that they themselves build up enough savings for retirement and the governments really are only there to act as a last resort? Or should we be saying actually that people need support throughout their lives, that um, retirement, if we have it, is simply a stage in that life and that governments have a responsibility to provide support to all of their citizens to ensure a decent standard of, of living and that if people have savings as well, that's on top of whatever their basic is. And that's kind of returned to the, to the post-war thinking. So in a way, it's kind of back to the 50s, but in a, a very shifted world where rather than having lots and lots of young people, children, as we had in the post-war era, and the era of building up capital, we've now got a lot of older people, smaller number of younger people, and more capital than we know what to do with, which we're not deploying predictive, particularly productively, because a lot of people who rely on the returns from those savings, they can't afford to lose that capital. They can't afford to take risks with it. And so we have an ex they have an expectation that their capital will be safe and they won't have to draw on it and they'll be able to pass it on to the next generation and that the returns on it will be sufficient to give them a decent standard of living in, in retirement. Squaring that circle is going to be quite a challenge for the governments and the central banks of the future. My guess is, is that um, they won't, neither side will be able to do it on their own. And therefore we will need to move into an era of much greater cooperation between um, fiscal authorities and central banks in which central banks will have to continue to be the backstop, the, the support, the, the, the shield, if you like, um, so that governments can carry a much greater 
um, responsibility for supporting their populations going forward and ensuring that um, what the, cap the excess capital we have is productively deployed into investment for the future rather than sitting around in safe assets not doing very much. Can I leave it there? <laughs> no, thanks a lot, Francis. That was that was a fascinating sort of setting setting this, the, the bigger the bigger stage for this discussion and, and talking about things which have little to do with this crisis and are just fundamentals in the economy that that we need to refer to. Uh, Philippa, do you do you want to follow? And then we finish with sure. You? Yeah. I mean, I have to say this makes me very happy because at the moment, the one question you get asked all the time in Germany when you talk about fiscal policy is how do we deal with all the debt from the Corona crisis? And to be honest, in comparison to the demographic issue we have and kind of the challenges that poses, the Corona debt is like nothing. Um, it literally wanes. I mean, also at the moment, Germany, when we issue new debt, we get paid for it. So I don't really see an issue with debt stock, but um, the challenges are just on, on different scales and we're completely missing that problem you've just talked about. Um, so very, very happy you put your focus on that. Um, maybe I want to take the other side of the coin. You very much now talked about um, how do we kind of provide a safety net? How do we make sure everybody has enough to, to live when they don't work anymore? Um, I want to think a little bit about what do we need to do to get people productive um, and to you know, somehow still have a working economy. You said we have scarce labor. So we really, really need to make the most of it. And I think we've missed a little bit that, you know, this is really what fiscal policy is for. Um, and that is if you want to talk about sustainable finances and um, I mean, what we're obsessed with in Germany, what you should really focus on because this is what, what generates taxes in the end and the future and ensures that the social safety net costs do not explode. Um, now here, this also hasn't been a topic so much because everybody claims we have full employment um, because people just look at the headline numbers. Um, and again, I think we need to take a step back um, as you did on the social safety net and look beyond those numbers. Uh, we have a quarter of, of working people on low wages. We have a lot of marginally employed, 7 million. Um, we have declining working hours in Germany, a lot of involuntary uh, part-time employment about twice the number we had in the in the 90s. So actually, I believe we have quite a lot of slack in the labor market. Um, and then, I mean, Pierre Monin, I think yesterday talked about what central banks can do kind of to work on the labor market and make it more productive. But when I read his slides, I really thought, yes, central banks can kind of help with that, but actually this is about fiscal policy. Um, and I mean, on both ends, I guess to some extent, he talked about the supply side. so you know, basically human capital and, and how do you bring that up to scratch and make sure people get the right education. Um, but obviously there's also a demand side element to it, right? Um, in Germany, I think we were quite happy about having a bit of a low wage sector because it means we're competitive internationally, um, but this will really, really come to bite us, I think, as um, our society is aging. So what can we do about this? What can fiscal policy do about this? Well, in Germany, we currently have a constitutional debt break, so a kind of a balanced budget rule. It allows us a bit of borrowing, even structural borrowing, but not much. Um, but the debt break also has a cyclical component. So when the economy is in a downturn, we are allowed to spend a little bit more. This component, and that's the very good news, is not in the constitution. So we can change the way the cyclical component is calculated without changing our constitution. The second, I think, interesting bit of news is this comes from Europe. So if we change this, I mean, it might be harder because it affects all of Europe, but it might also be good because actually what we need is probably a change in, in fiscal rules at the European level. Um, and the third bit of good news, I think, is this bit directly links back to the labor market and getting to full employment. Because at the moment, the way we calculate whether the economy is at full capacity or not is by looking at the, the NAVRU, which is a close relative of the NIRU. So basically, the lowest or what was considered to be the lowest possible rate of unemployment without getting inflation. Now, in Germany, we haven't really seen that inflation has happened, even if we were below that rate. And we were below that rate about 50% of the time. Um, so maybe actually we can go a lot lower. So 
one thing I think we should look at is can we replace that bid um, with full employment, go in a similar direction as the Fed did in the US. Um, so maybe go in sync with the central banks of the world, but but still do it through fiscal policy. And maybe I should stop here. Yeah, that's that's great as well. You made your point uh, super clear. I don't see. I'm going to pass the the floor to Josh in a second. I still don't see any any hands raised, so that, that's okay. Uh, you know, take your time, prepare your questions. Maybe you agree with everything that's been said. Then you can use in the reactions button a, a thumb up or a clap. Or you don't understand anything that's being discussed. Then you, you should raise your hand, uh, or or you'll have question later. Um, and and we we doing well. We have in, even more participants than in the beginning, uh, ninety five. So that, that's quite impressive for such a, a technical discussion. And let's face it, we're competing with friends organizing parallel panels on central banks. So obviously people get it. It's all down to fiscal. Josh. Thanks, uh, Benoit. Um, I'm going to. Uh, sort of try and just briefly lay out the, the sort of fundamentals of uh, two different regimes. Um, one regime, one would might call a, a regime of fiscal dominance, uh, which I think we had essentially from, arguably from the, the 1930s, uh, but, but certainly from the, in the post-war period up until about the 1970s. Um, and then I think we've moved into a regime which you might call monetary dominance uh, since then, which I would say has lasted um, maybe up until the financial crisis of 2008, but one could argue it continued and that only now with the COVID pandemic uh, is it being seriously sort of challenged. So firstly, the, the uh, and, and by the way, I'm doing this because I think it's a good way of, of thinking about the fundamentals of why fiscal policy needs to sort of return from the, the wilderness. Um, so, so the regime of fiscal dominance, essentially, you had um, ministries of finance essentially setting the broad economic um, uh, plan for the economy and the central bank played a uh, supporting accommodative role in that uh, policy regime. So it uh, ensured that the government could spend um, as much money as it needed to to, to ensure full employment, to uh, support the industrial uh, strategic industrial objectives of the day, the industries that were viewed as uh, important for economic growth and for, for job creation. It also supported that process via controls over um, exchange rates, so intervening in, in capital markets. Um, and uh, uh, essentially you had much more what you might call policy coordination and policy coherence between the Ministry of Finance, uh, monetary policy and industrial policy as well. And of course, the focus was very much on maintaining aggregate demand as a Keynesian policy of, of the state ensuring there was, there was full employment. Um, then we moved um, in the 1970s with the very high inflations. Um, this, this regime was challenged. The, the, the very high inflations were blamed, on, um, were blamed on excessive government spending and very large public deficits. Um, and I'm just going to sort of bring up a slide here, which um, essentially shows um, the, the assumptions of this new um, regime uh, of what you might call um, monetary dominance. And I'm basically just going to quickly try and run through uh, those assumptions. Can everybody see that, hopefully? Um, now, th th this regime es essentially makes these assumptions down the left-hand column. Um, the first key assumption is that there is a limited amount of uh, money out there in the, in the world, as it were. Um, this is theory of, of loanable funds. Essentially, um, you have a sort of um, a, a finite amount of money. Uh, and what this means is if, if the government is to, if the government starts spending more of these limit, this limited amount of money, there's a danger that it will crowd out the private sector. Um, and that the private sector, um, once the natural rate of interest, which is the, the rate at which you um, uh, essentially a sort of equilibrium rate at, at which the uh, demand for savings, um, the, sorry, the demand for investment is perfectly met, met by the amount that people are saving. Um, and that's when you get a sort of optimum allocation of capital into the economy. So the savings um, and investment are aligned at this so-called natural rate of, of interest. Um, 
the reality is that that's not a true description of, of the world. We actually have what's called in the academic literature endogenous money. Banks create new money. Um, uh, and uh, essentially, you, um, uh, uh, you don't have a, a limit on the amount of money um, in the economy. Um, and you also don't have uh, 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 this, this concept of the natural rate of interest then doesn't really apply. Actually, what we've seen is interest rates falling um, uh, over the last sort of 50 years. They've been gradually falling. Um, 1970s, uh, they were raised by central banks to, to deal with inflation, but, but, but the general trend is a fall. Um, there's also this evidence of crowding out has also been challenged. There's, there's actually a lot of evidence that the right kind of spending, the government can play a key role by um, attracting in and de-risking private finance by making large investments. So the renewable energy sector is a classical example um, where uh, uh, big spending by um, state investment banks or by government utility, publicly owned utilities has crowded in private finance. So this crowding out thesis doesn't apply. The, the sort of key underlying assumption, of course, is that financial markets allocate credit efficiently. Uh, and of course, uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. That was shown most obviously in 2008 with the financial crisis. Um, so in fact, the evidence suggests that when you deregulate financial markets and fiscal policy plays a less, uh, a less of a, a big role in, in demand in the economy, financial markets tend to shift towards allocating towards existing assets, in particular real estate or existing financial assets. Um, when there isn't confidence in particular in productive assets, uh, financial markets typically move towards those. Um, and they thus generate instability. This is Minsky's sort of hypothesis, essentially. Um, the other assumption is that fiscal policy and fiscal stimulus is only really useful in the short term. It's, it's useful when you have a recession or a shock, exogenous shock to the economy, it can help stabilize the economy. Actually, the evidence now, I think, suggests that fiscal policy can have long run effects um, that fiscal multipliers can be very high and can be very long lasting. And in particular, certain types of investment, and this is research we've been doing at IIPP, can lead to, to, to um, structural changes in, in the economy that can lead to very long lasting improvements in, in demand and innovation in particular. Finally, the trade-off, this Phillips curve that, that um, Philippa was talking about, the Nairi, this trade-off between inflation and employment that if you have um, too much employment you'll get an excessively high level of inflation um, that has also been shown to be uh, wrong I think and, um, certainly since the 1990s the correlation between inflation and employment has has disappeared so that again justifies fiscal policy targeting full employment or, or high level of, of aggregate demand finally um, monetary financing uh, and deficit, large deficits in this regime of monetary dominance are seen as inherently inflationary. And that's why we have the prohib prohibition of monetary financing in the Maastricht Treaty, uh, um, which, which Ben was talking about earlier. Um, actually, the evidence for this is very weak. There was a specific period in time from the 1970s um, uh, up, to the, up to the 1980s in certain countries like South America, for example, where one could just about make this sort of argument, um, where there were high inflations possibly driven by excessive government spending. However, in most regimes with mature institutions, um, this sort of hyperinflation, the sort of Weimar Zimbabwe scenario doesn't occur, actually. Um, so I think that sort of weakens this, this argument for for, for, for the sort of holy trinity, that, that sort of concept that Ben was talking about of independent central banks, very tight focus on low inflation, 2% inflation, uh, and interest rates as the tool to achieve that. Now we've seen, um, obviously, uh, since um, the COVID crisis kicked in this huge, um, well, since the financial crisis of 2000, a huge increase in implicit mon monetary financing of, of government spending. And this chart just shows the Eurozone, the UK, the US and Japan massively increasing their holdings of government debt. This is the percentage of total government debt. So you can see in, in the UK and Japan, we now hold upwards of 35% of, of government debt. Um, so, uh, and there hasn't been any inflation. 
right? There hasn't been any, in fact, there's been deflation, you know, the, the central banks have consistently missed their 2% inflation target. So there's no evidence for this sort of um, correlation. And this chart just shows the, the flattening Phillips curve. You see, it was downward sloping in earlier periods since the 1990s. It's, it's no longer the, the case. So, I mean, I just wanted to run through that quickly because I think it's really important that we interrogate the underlying assumptions of um, the reason we should restrain fiscal policy and allow monetary policy to play a more dominant role. And uh, I think there's an increasing intellectual recognition uh, of people like you know, Larry Summers basically admitting um, finally that the problem is not just around short term frictions in the economy um, that are best adjusted with through changes to interest rates. There's a, there's a more fundamental problem of, of aggregate demand. Um, and I think that, that, that very strongly suggests the, the European Union needs to think about um, not returning to the, the, the sort of tight budget regime we had pre-COVID, but putting in place a more permanent and much more flexible uh, fiscal policy regime with the ECB providing an accommodative stance uh, for governments to spend to achieve full employment and to achieve um, green jobs and, the, and the, the net zero carbon transition that we need. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Josh. That was that was a great overview. Um, I see two questions in the chat. So, so panelists, you want to look at them? I think Francis or Josh certainly you want to pick up on the first one, or because we had a discussion about that in the preparation. Um, maybe the second one, Josh. There's also a hands uh, raised, Nathan. So. Maybe we first, um, you want to pick up uh, some of the panelists. So, Philippe or Francis, do you want to react to Josh or start responding to the questions in the chat? Um, otherwise, we can also take uh, Nathan's question uh, before you respond. I can, I can just add to what you said, Josh. We, we talked a lot about the quantities um, and how fiscal should be much more ambitious and then supported by. Uh, by monetary, I think, given the sort of the frame of this conference and the discussion on climate change and inequalities, Philippa touched on the on the latter. Um, there's also the question of direction, right? I think we, we what what's been said, I think, is in terms of giving a direction. And Josh, you, you did mention that with industrial policy and the likes. Um, this is definitely what what governments and what ministries of finance are equipped to do. And 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 you hear from from client scientists or. Uh, environmental economists that what we actually need if we stand a chance to stay below an increase in temperatures of two degrees is basically something like a war economy for, for, for a number of 10 to 20 years. And, and I mean, it's something that aggressive. So just, just going and planting a few windmills here and there, it's just not gonna cut it. So um, yeah, I think that's another reason, not just the quantities, but so, okay. So the audience is getting into this. So. Uh, Nathan, maybe go with your question, and then please, Pam, let's just, just let me know when you want to come in and respond to the questions. Nathan, you were first, and then we have uh, Randeep and uh, Matthias. And we have the questions on the chat. Let's not forget those. Yes, hello. Can everybody hear me? Absolutely. Yes, great. Well, thank you very much for three um, very to-the-point statements. They were all interesting. And my question is regarding something that Francis mentioned um, in the, in the end of her talk, and that Josh also picked up in his slides, which is regarding the question of using the credit that we have in the economy productively, which is something that actually furthers society's goals. And as Josh mentioned, that financial markets, if left to their own devices, sort of uh, move towards um, inflating existing assets rather than actually um, helping productive activity. So I'm wondering what kind of credit guidance policies do you think are fit uh, for the 21st century, because I believe we had some before 70s and 80s deregulation. Do you think we should have different risk ways for productive investments or more public investment banks? What kind of policies do you think work nowadays? I, I'm happy to have a go at that, um, Bernard. Or do you want to take a couple of questions? And... I think please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. And let's and try to cover as many as possible. So concise questions and concise answers, if that's possible. But uh... yeah. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, so you're right that uh, in, in that um, era of fiscal dominance, there was um, quite strong credit controls and credit guidance uh, policies imposed by central banks and financial supervisors and ministries of finance. And what these did essentially is they steered credit towards, uh, as you say, productive sectors, you know, high value added manufacturing, and they actually repressed 
um, uh, for example, consumer credit and um, and even mortgage credit, which seems a very strange concept to us today when we're all used to get all these subsidies for our first time buyers on housing and the like. But actually it proved to be effective. I mean, we, the, this was a period where we had the highest levels of, of growth. Um, countries industrialized at very rapid speed and they actually you know, transformed their economies quite, quite fast. Um, and you did have powerful public state investment banks also playing that credit steering role. Um, and I think we have to return to something like those processes. Now, I think there are perhaps challenges with some forms of credit guidance because we have a much more globalized financial system. We don't have capital controls in place. So there's more opportunities for the sort of the capital markets and the shadow banking system that, that Daniela has been talking about to provide credit even when the central bank limits what commercial banks can do in terms of, of lending. So one would have to think about also, I think, regulating the capital, market, capital markets sector to, to some extent, which is a you know, controversial area, but something worth thinking about. Um, but, I, but I think, yes, yeah, state investment banks would be, would be absolutely key to that process. We need to re-embrace institutions which, which can, in a sense, both support fiscal policy, but be you know, off the balance sheet of the public deficit so that's their advantage that the, 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 the loans they make in most European countries anywhere off the public sector balance sheet but they're creating assets at the same time and again they can give direction to markets support you know missions um, such as decarbonisation uh, as well as creating jobs in the right parts of the country so yeah absolutely we need those sorts of policies. Thanks a lot. So we'll take uh, Randeep's question and then we'll go to Francis who will respond to two questions which are uh, in the chat. Um, Randeep and then Matthias after Francis. Randeep? Yeah. Just want to unmute yourself and then we, we can we can see you. Randeep, we, yeah, there we go. We, we still cannot hear you properly, I think. No. We, I, yeah. No, Charlie, Char I'm really sorry, we can't hear you. So let's just wait a second, I'll be back to you in a second. Let's go to, uh, uh, to Francis, if you wanted to respond to the, to the questions in the chat and then back to Randy. Yeah, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I wanted to pick up. The first was from David, um, so I wanted to, who is asking about um, monetary financing in times of shadow banking, but it has a fundamentally different purpose to that of the 50s and 60s. And I think we've seen in the last 10 years, actually monetary financing and austerity can absolutely go hand in hand with each other. We've seen central banks using QE to keep um, to just try and maintain aggregate demand in, in economies which are being hit with quite a considerable Hi. fiscal drag uh, from, aus from austerity. Um, and I think that um, it really is time we pulled back on that and said, actually, that's really not a very efficient way of using either fiscal policy or QE, um, that what you want is both to be pulling in the same direction. So if you're going to use QE, you need to have a, a fiscal stance that is that is pro-growth and not um, and not obsessed with reducing deficits and 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 bearing down on debt at the expense of growth, which is what we've seen in the last ten years. So we need that shift, that move to a. a position where central banks and fiscal sheet, fiscal authorities are singing from the same hymn sheet, um, because otherwise we're, it's a recipe for stagnation, really. And kind of related to that, there was a question from Matus about the, so the, the, the dog that didn't bark, really, the, the QE inflation dog, um, because the fact that QE has been used in conjunction with an austerity fiscal stance is, to, in my view, the principal reason why there has been no inflation from QE. Um, now, I'm of the opinion, actually, that left to itself, QE is mildly deflationary, actually, because of the um, downwards pressure on interest rates, um, reduces the income of uh, incomes of people on fixed incomes, which I talked about in my introductory remarks. Um, so you need QE to be actually stimulatory, and it cannot be while you've got a fiscal drag going on. So that, in my view, is why what we've seen over the last decade has been 
no inflation. In fact, if anything, downwards pressure on, on inflation, quite the opposite of what we expected from QE. I, I hope that answers the question. So, so if we want QE to work going forward, then we need fiscal authorities to be spending, not cutting spending. Thanks a lot. Um, we'll now go to Randy, who's fixed the, the issue. There's also a question in the chat with that thing is, is uh, it's a bit provocative, but it's quite clear. Is it not perverse that much investment for world health issues such as malaria now relies on private foundations such as the Carter or Gates Foundation rather than government? So that's, um, yeah, we, we can discuss that. I guess the answer is in the question though, but Randy. Hi, can you hear me now, Bernard? Brilliant. Um, thanks very much. I, I was quite interested in uh, the speakers. Uh, uh, I think it's Philippa who's, uh, who was talking about slack in the economy. And really, to set fiscal policy free, uh, yet one has to understand whether inflationary pressures can be mitigated or controlled or what slack there is. Uh, did the panel think that inflation is a result of too much spending, irrespective of whether that's financed by money or debt? Plainly, um, the old theory that governments kept borrowing too much uh, would see interest rise, interest rates rise is plainly wrong um, or hasn't been proved right in this, in this case. So it was, a, it was a question really for which, how does one deal with the fact that fiscal policy has been restrained by concerns about inflation, which now bring back the old arguments of institutions versus say technology that's uh philippa you were mentioned so you can respond i mean josh obviously as, as francis just intervened you, you might also pick it up philippa you you do you want to happy to respond yeah um very very good question and i think one that we really need to think very seriously about if we want to set fiscal policy free as as you said um i mean probably the other two are much better positioned to talk about the the history of of inflation but one thing that you notice when you study it closely in Germany also, you know, at a slightly shorter time scale, but looking at it really at on the sectoral level as well, is that inflation really has many, many different reasons. And just saying, you know, it always comes from the demand side or it always comes from the supply side, always from this factor. Um, I don't know, it just seems the biggest over, uh, oversimplification ever. Um, so I guess two, two answers um, I have at the moment preliminarily. The first one is we need to understand it much, much more closely and really look at reality and we need to look at relative prices rather than just aggregate headline inflation. When you do that for Germany for the last 15, 20 years, really what you find is that a lot of inflation is supply driven in the sense that you can associate um, big jumps in prices with legislation. So the biggest jumps we see in the healthcare sector, and that's normally because some kind of law on healthcare insurance changed and the way you know doctors can bill stuff. Um, so that really has nothing to do with, with the demand side. Um, so first of all, you need to be much more careful in your analysis and you need to go beyond the aggregate level. And then the second one, I think, and we need to do that to you know, kind of be, be responsible is we need to think about tools beyond um, the basically a macro intervention and jacking up interest rates um, to deal with um, price increases in certain sectors. Uh, it can't just be that we have it in one sector and you know because of that we take the biggest hammer we find and you know kind of uh, just just kill the whole economy. Um, so so maybe get slightly more refined analysis and tools. Thanks a lot, Lita. That is pretty. We I'll. I'll keep the discussion going. Uh, Matthias has been waiting. Um, I, th I think in relation to the comment on the fact that the, all these private foundations are now basically you know, funding major world health projects, uh, it has to do with something that, that Francis mentioned in terms of uh, taxing capital versus taxing labor. And, and, I, and I guess also how taxation is, 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 is one resource for um, creating fiscal space, if you should, that, should do that. Maybe, maybe fiscal space is a notion that we want to abandon, but but, and, and strikingly enough, the, these discussions are, are not taking place. There, there's a discussion about should we go back to austerity or not, but there's not a discussion about how about the trends in taxation and, and, and in tax evasion as well uh, um, we've seen over the last 20, 30 years and, and what 
in Bangladesh. Could I actually yeah, just sure. add a word or two on, on this one? Um, I'm sorry sure. to just jump in, jump in. But so before I worked at the Ministry of Finance in Germany, I, I worked in Liberia and at the World Bank and, you know, kind of the Ebola crisis there. Um, so this is a topic that's very close to my heart. Um, and I mean, talking about capital and um, abundant capital, for I think far, far too long, we had this narrative of scarce capital. So in development aid, um, we basically always try to see what we can shift off the balance sheet of development banks. So rather than saying, oh wait, health is really, you know, one of the fundamental services, maybe private foundations shouldn't be doing this. And this is really one of the things that um, official development organizations should take care of. We were like, great, they're doing it. All right, we can draw back. Um, so I think it's it's thinking carefully about the sources of capital and, and what is really right. And I mean, yes, obviously, I completely agree with the implied answer, but I think it has to do with not being sharp in our thinking on what the constraints are. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, we go to Matthias, who's been very patient, and then Josh will respond to Colleen's question, and then we need more. And otherwise, I'd like to bring the discussion to um, you know, concrete opportunities. You know, there's a big discussion in Brussels about the, the, the sort of the future of the fiscal rules. Should, should, should they stay lifted until 2023? Right now, they, they said to come back in 2022. So the, so the famous 3%, 60% that Josh mentioned in the Maastricht Treaty, should, they, should we keep them suspended? But also the, the bigger fiscal framework and the way economic governance uh, and fiscal coordination across and economic coordination across the EU works. We've been discussing all of that. Now, I'd also like to hear what, what, what can happen? I mean, basically bring the discussion to the ground saying, yeah, if you were a finance minister or an EU leader, what, what this, what's the sort of thing you would propose as, as, as action in the next few months? Matthias. Yeah, hello, hi. So I want to go back to the, to the title of the seminar. So should central banks save the world? The role of fiscal policy. So, um, I think it's, it should be used to, to, to discuss issues which are in the middle, so and which I am just missing. What, what do I mean? I mean the point of the rising debt, the debt not only of the public or the private or the corporates, but of all non financial sectors since decades, since the World War II, in relation to GDP. And I think this issue had to be tackled. So there's no point in going back to the 70s since the debt is, is rising and it uh, diminished, the rise diminished somewhat after the, the policy change in the last years, so, so the lower interest rates, but it's still increasing. So how to handle that point? And I think this is a, a point which has to be addressed in combination between fiscal policy and uh, central banks, and, and maybe new ideas must be taken off how, how to, to, to deal with it, how to uh, come up to that issue. And in relation to it, the next point, so climate change means that we have to use less resources, less, not only less oil, but also less concrete, uh, less iron, and so on and so forth. And this will led to the outcome that either we cannot do anything about on the climate change or we have to break growth or even decrease. And we have to think about a world where welfare is, is possible to warrant without growth. This is not in, in, in the thinking. So I have nothing against growth if it's green growth, but if you ha must have growth, you can't enter that it's green. And on that point, so this point is also missing, and it's also in the, uh, in the room between fiscal policy and, 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 mm. and monetary or financial policy. Mm. And one issue to, to come to a concrete point is, what does it mean for nowadays? For example, so the interest rate is going down, probably it'll stack there, probably have to go even lower. So uh, some new, that Miles Kimball and Uge Achawal or even Rogoff say we have to go deep negative. So it can also mean um, negative interest and, and cash by standing the issue here on it in combination with the measures Miles Achawal proposed. One only to mention one example. Um, but this 
puts pressure on other points, mm -hmm. like on the housing market. And for mm -hmm. that, there are solutions which are not in the central bank, but in the fiscal policy, mm -hmm. like a rent value tax. Um, so as uh, um, yeah, proposed uh, also in Germany was in, in the discussion yeah. by the Naturschutzbund, yeah, um, and some some other um, uh, organizations, um, because uh, if the land is not uh, any longer in, in private hands, or the value of the land, the land still is in the mm -hmm. private hands, but not the value, you don't have the pressure on, on the market. And I I miss in in some point the kind of the room between central banks and fiscal policy and the fundamental issues which we are facing yeah since some times but which we are facing yeah. okay thanks a lot matthias um, i'm quite happy i'm not sitting on a panel with, with all these these massive questions um maybe francis quickly and then josh i think you wanted you wanted to come in so france first and then and then josh and 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 then for the moment we don't have any questions we, we might go back to philippa Sure. Um, in fact, I, I've kind of touched on this a bit because obviously um, the other side of a massive debt buildup is a massive buildup in assets, you know, because for every debt there is an asset holder. Debt's, debt is assets. So um, the abundant capital we have lying around the place is also abundant debt. It's kind of this two sides of the same coin. So the question we have to ask ourselves is whether that debt and therefore that capital is sustainable. I have to say that one of the ways in the past that the human race has used to get rid of excess capital is to have a war. I hope we don't do that again. Um, so, but these are the kind of questions we need to address. It, I mean, it, um, if we are going to have much more capital, then we need to deploy it productively. But in the, there is a question as to how much debt the private sector can absorb and, and our perception really of government debt. And maybe it's time for stopping panicking about government debt and accept that, you know, Japan led the way on this one. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to result in a, an inflationary collapse. Um, and that maybe we are moving towards recognizing that um, government debt is the assets of the private sector and something to be welcomed, not um, feared quite as much as it is. Um, there was a lot to unpick in Matthias's comment. I mean, your comment about the housing market is a very fair one, and we have not solved this. Um, we, at the moment, are still trying to hang on to a paradigm in which the only way people can acquire, can own their own houses is to get ever deeper into debt. Um, and other markets where they say, well, the solution then is for everybody to rent or to have a divided market where rich people can own their own houses, but poor, half the population can't. Um, somehow we have to deal with this. And there are issues about inequality and unfairness about this. And also the whole question of, of kind of green transition and how we make our housing stocks green and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. um, which I might leave other people to comment on. But that would be my comment about that we need to have a conversation. Um, not just about uh, about abundant capital, much of which takes the form of abundant debt. Thanks a lot, Francis. Uh, Josh, I think you wanted to comment on negative interest rates, and, and indeed, there's also the question of of, of degrowth and, and how uh, potentially you know either forced degrowth or organized degrowth, and, and how that comes into the picture. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. <laughs> we would need two hours just for that. But let me just start the session. All right, Josh. Yeah, so um, just on the negative interest rates debate, which is which is getting interesting in the UK at the moment, the, the Bank of England is is now um, consulting with commercial banks on how they would deal with negative interest rates. They just announced that I think yesterday, actually. Um, so they they are looking to, to potentially implement it. I mean, I just don't. I think this is a red herring, basically. I mean, actually, the in the UK case. I think the head of the Building Societies Association has come back and said this is a, a terrible idea because it will essentially mean that banks are having to um, uh, lose interest on the on the reserves they're holding at the central bank. And that means they will have to find that money from somewhere else. And what they'll do, he says, is they'll raise interest rates on mortgages, which is the exact opposite of the, the, the policy, the objective of the policy, which is that that cut in interest rates would be passed on to consumers. The issue here isn't really the price of money. There's plenty of liquidity out there. Banks have a stuffed full of reserves if they want to be. 
Um, the issue is there is a lack of demand in the productive sectors of the economy for the right kinds of finance. Okay, the demand is for buying existing assets, whether it's housing or it's it's shares. Um, it's, companies are doing share buybacks or mergers and acquisitions to inflate share prices. They're not investing in new products and new services. They're not raising wages. Uh, they're not stimulating demand in the economy. And neither is the government. At least it wasn't until until COVID, arguably. Um, so so that's 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 that point on, on the degrowth concept. Yeah, this is really, really important. I mean, we had the Dasgupta review of the economics of biodiversity just published this week, which essentially, you know, it's a sort of bit of a mixed uh, report, but at, at one point it essentially admits that, um, you know, infinite growth is impossible. We are bounded by our planet and by our, our ecosystems. And if our ecosystems collapse, the rest of the economy will, will collapse. So there are hard limits to growth, um, but it is possible to have green growth, as you, as you say. Um, and it is possible, I think, to create jobs um, that de, you know via dematerializing um, processes in the economy um, and uh, we need to just speed that process up uh, rapidly uh, and maybe we do need you know basic income or some other form of um, income to support people who otherwise are, are, are going to be um, sort of left behind by this process and the, the gilet jaune problem will keep on uh, arising I think yeah if I can just come back in briefly, because I just wanted to pick up on something that Josh said, um, which is to do with, um, in a way, the reason why it's so difficult to get um, productive investment, to get all this capital deployed productively, is because the owners of capital are actually quite risk averse. Um, they don't want to take losses. And that's because for the first time in history, we actually have a lot of people on not exceptionally high incomes, um, saving for their retirements. Um, and they can't afford to take losses. They don't want to take losses. And so many of our institutional investors are very risk averse because that's what their customers need. So the question then is, it comes back to my point about the need for a safety net. That the government's role, in a way, is to protect, to, to support, to provide a, a floor, if you like, so that we can actually deploy capital productively into the economy without raising the risk that um, millions of people will have their pension savings wiped out. Um, or at least that's what they fear. Um, I, I, we, we need to bring those two sides together. We can have green investment. We can have um, investment in things that could go pear-shaped startups, innovation, all the rest of it. But there has to be that underpinning of, of safety. Um, one of the con consistent themes um, in the aftermath of the financial crisis was discussion about safe assets, which is what actually failed in the financial crisis. And in fact, ever since then, we've increasingly relied on governments to provide them, but governments haven't wanted to provide them because they've been cutting, pulling back on the production of these safe assets. Um, this is something that Daniela touches on. It's an area where I kind of disagree with her a bit, because I think actually, you know, markets have evolved to where they are, and it's all very well saying, can we just upend the whole thing and go back to the 1950s? But I don't think we can. And whether we like it or not, governments do provide safe assets to financial markets. I'd like to see governments providing safe assets to labour markets. Um, so I'm with Josh on the need for a universal basic income, that income support that means that if somebody loses their job, they don't lose everything. Thanks a lot, Francis. Um, we'll start wrapping up because we unfortunately only have five minutes left. I um, want to go back to Philippa. If Josh and Francis, you want to say one last word. Otherwise, I'll, I'll sort of set the landscape in terms of what's going to be discussed in Brussels in the coming months. And hopefully everyone here um, you know, puts their way in uh, towards the, the, the right solutions. Because let's face it, there is a, a, a possibility that governments decide to go back to the fiscal rules and, and basically we need to pay back that COVID debt. I mean, that's, that idea, unfortunately, is not completely killed. Uh, Philippa. So maybe actually to, to build on what you just said, what can we do so that governments don't just go back to these rules or that we don't just go back to that in, in Europe? Because I think we all agreed on the panel that at the moment, um, the balance of tasks or whatever you want to call it between the ECB and, and European governments is, is not optimal. Um, I think the ECB has actually advanced a lot. Um, they've now introduced this term favor of financing conditions, which they're trying to maintain, which is essentially like, you know, we're going to keep financing conditions in a way that governments can do active fiscal policy. Um, but what do we need to do so governments get to better fiscal policies? I think there are two things we really, really need to do 
um, the academic community and to some extent the media has flashed out why there is a problem with the status quo. And I think policymakers, you know, are there with us. But the really tricky thing is what to do. Um, and there are not that many answers around yet that are, you know, very well road tested and can be Im implemented that well. So I think really working on those is one task. And then the other one is we need a positive narrative for them. For a German policymaker to go out and say, well, that isn't that dangerous. It's kind of okay right now. So, you know, I'm going to abandon debt break. That's just never going to work. They need to go out and need to be able to say, well, here is our mission for the next 20 years, and this is what we're going to do. Um, and it needs to be something positive, not this isn't so bad. It just doesn't really work, um, I think, to overcome the, the current regime. So all of you who are interested in doing this, I think these are the two things that we can really contribute to, to shift where policy is right now. Mm. And, and as you say, you know, a, a vision or a mission for the next 20 years is definitely missing. So s sitting in Brussels here, you, you see, you hear about the Green Deal and the Green Transition. Uh, I mean, mind you, the Green Deal is, is a communication from the, from the commission, right? So in case you thought it's, it's a law or regulation, it's just, it's a piece of communication really. And, and, and there is something as you know about the, the, the need for member states to, to spend the recovery money on the green transition and the di digital transformation, whatever that means, but it, this, is, this is really sort of weak and vague. So, I mean, it's nothing like what you just called for, which is you, you need a, a sort of plan for the next 20 years and a, and a vision, which is, which is possibly what's needed to make this all work together. Um, we're going to eat two or three minutes at, uh, at your coffee break, I think, if that's okay with you. I know, Fiona, you need to, to say a few words, a few, I guess, housekeeping rules, for, maybe for the rest of the conference. Uh, Josh and Francis, if you want to have a last, a last word. Uh, we've covered most questions. There, there are two or three pending uh, that we might have missed, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't got a lot more to add, really. I mean, I, I, ju I just think this is a key moment in time because the, the EU clearly has relaxed its, its budget rules, the 60% rules, and it is putting into place um, this new borrowing uh, facility, um, the, the recovery and resilience facility that, that term was mentioned. Um, they just need to be made permanent. Both of those things need to be made permanent and they need to be aligned with the net zero 2050 uh, decarbonization target also with the, the, EC, uh, the European Union's biodiversity strategy. Um, we've got two huge summits coming up this year um, in May on biodiversity and in uh, November COP26 on climate change. The EU needs to be a leader on both of those and it, and it has the chance to do that now by aligning fiscal policy with, those, with its own targets around sustainability and, and climate change. Uh, and the, the third pillar of course is, is inequality. Uh, how does it also ensure that fiscal policy supports uh, the regions most in need of, of jobs? Um, so that's the way forward, I think. Thanks a lot. Francis, a, a last word or? Did you no, just, just an observation really, that in a way it's not surprising that, that central that, um, governments and central banks are struggling with what to do from here, because as well as they're trying to cope with a current crisis and a crisis that, you know, okay, it may appear to be one off, but we're probably going to see this kind of crisis again. In fact, it's quite surprising we haven't seen it before, really. Um, but also that it's actually quite hard. It's quite a fake failure of imagination, really. And we could do with a lot of scientific of science fiction to help us like we had in the Cold War era. Um, and we ha kind of haven't got now um, to help us imagine a world in which um, there's there's no growth or very little growth because uh, a world that doesn't have fossil fuels is actually very hard to imagine because the whole of economics really has been in a time of fossil fuels. It's been the story of fossil fuel growth really. And so it's very hard even for economists to imagine a time with no fossil fuels with all the e e energy coming from renewable sources. That's immensely difficult to imagine. It's also very difficult to imagine a world in which you have aging populations and you're having to think about um, how people need to change the way they work during their lives as their as their needs change and their um, 
and their, their health varies and so forth. And that's not something we've faced before. Plus, as I said, the, the phenomenon of retirement, which people really do like, and which, like I said, is an historical anomaly that we've never really adapted to. And the third part of this, which is sort of driven, it, it's partly driven by that and partly also by our own ingenuity and innovation, is these fundamental changes in the nature of work, um, you know, the digital age and the rest of it. Um, which um, again is difficult for us to imagine because it's not how we've lived in the past. So bring all of those three together and you kind of have a perfect storm, a paradigm shift. It's totally understandable that people are struggling with this. But for me, it does mean um, that um, we are going to see much larger roles for institutions, for, for governments in the future. And in a way, a reversal certainly of the kind of, of private sector driven um, growth and um, investment and uh, and general support that we've seen in the last 40 years. Mm. No, absolutely. And to, to, to wrap it up, the, um, what you just said means this better be a, a long-term um, structural shift because there, there's a discussion now that, okay, you have your recovery moment, so you can spend that money now, and then that's it, the window is closing this year. And then, and, and what you just said is that, well, actually they don't have the beginning of a plan. So, so asking them to do this dream, just and green transition in the coming months doesn't work because they just you just said it it's such a massive even imagination exercise that they need to be able to to spend that sort of money uh, in, in the quantities over the next decades really uh, which is i guess a strong argument to to the crazy idea that we should we should turn turn off the tap now and have governments reimbursing that debt all right i thought it was pr a pretty fascinating uh, discussion we've uh, i think we've done well responding to maybe 95 percent of questions and fiona you want to say a few words now i think Thanks for, for the panelists. I think it was this was uh, really fascinating. Thanks, yes. Pamela. Thanks. Hi, I'm Fiona. I'm part of the conference team. I want to quickly give you two organizational points. But first of all, thank you, uh, Benoit, for organizing and hosting this workshop. And of course, uh, to our speakers for taking the time. Uh, so first, uh, we now have a short break of about 10 minutes. And then we will continue in the plenary room uh, with a keynote on central banking and climate change by Sylvie Guar. Uh, she's the second deputy governor of Banque de France, and this will be followed by a panel with Daniela Gabor, Sabine Lautenschläger, and again Sylvie Goulart, and uh, hosted by Frank van Leeuwen. I think it will tie in quite well with this workshop. And the second thing is uh, that since we meet online <laughs> and we cannot really uh, get into contact with other uh, conference participants, we uh, try want to try a little thing with you it's called wonder me and you can just follow this link if you want uh, wait i have to copy it um and then you can create a little avatar and you can drag and drop them to another person and when you're close enough then it opens a little uh, conference call and can you can chat so i hope to see you back in the plenary room and thanks a lot uh yeah bye bye Fiona, I think we don't see the yes. avatar yet, yeah? The link to the avatar. Ah, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. No, should be work. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.